guys, welcome back to another video in this channel. I have uh, several announcements, so let's start with the list. First of all, I would like to offer a very sincere apology to one of our users, the unknown man. He submitted his uh, little creature creation for our last uh, whimsical creature contest. We did see it, we did evaluate it, but I forgot to add it to the final like slideshow that I was showing with everyone else. I don't know, it just slipped my mind. I, I thought I had everyone and I missed that one. So I'm truly sorry, my friend. If you haven't seen my message, please reach out to me on the email that is provided on the uh, Creature Contest results so that I can make it up for you. Now, on the second part and on a, on a different note, um, our course is still ongoing, so we still have the sale ongoing. We have two more days, I believe, for the 90% discount. So if you guys want to check it out, make sure to go here down into the description. There's going to be a 90% count, the 90 discount code for the course, the mechanical animal making course in Udemy. Uh, I, I've been receiving a lot of very cool feedback. Thank you very much for the support, guys. And if you want to check it out, well, it's down here. Another one, another important note is our portfolio reviews are open. So if you guys want your stuff to be reviewed in the next month, which is in two weeks, I believe, or is it next week? No, two weeks. In two more weeks, make sure to uh, submit down here on the description. Again, there's going to be a portfolio link for you. We're going to have our live stream tomorrow or not tomorrow on Monday. I'm going to take a couple of uh, one day off uh, to, to rest and, and be with the family. But we're going to we're going to return with a um, live stream on Monday. Where we're doing this very cool Wizards Wand. So if you want to check it out, uh, make sure sure to um, to like hit the little bell icon so you get the notification but we're gonna go live 9 a.m mexico time 8 30 p.m india time and i think that's it Whew. what else is there anything else that i want to share well we're working on the, the newest course um eduardo Ed fox he's just finished the concert where he's finishing the concert at the time of this recording and i'm gonna start recording this weekend so that we can get this one by the end of this month it's going to be very cool, guys. I think you guys are going to like it. So today we're going to talk about a very, very requested topic. It's it's not something that I was uh, thinking about recording, to be honest, but we had so many requests that I think it's it's worth mentioning, and that is the Hypershade. What the hell is the Hypershade inside of Maya? Well, here we go. The Hypershade is one of the like big, big menus or big areas inside of Maya. We're going to be doing a lot of uh, material connections and stuff. And there's a lot of hidden features and hidden things in, inside of the Hypershade that can make it very, very confusing. It mostly has to do with shading. However, you can do other stuff here inside of the Hypershade. Now, first thing you're going to notice is up here we have this, guys, right here which are the like previews of the different materials. If I were to create, like, let's say, a new blend material and I change its color to red, you're going to see that it updates right here. Back in the day, my teachers used to recommend keeping these guys as just single lines right here or very small thumbnail because it tends to um, like affect your performance. It actually needs to create and render some thumbnails for you. So it could crash if you have like a thousand or like several hundred like uh, elements right here. But that's it. Here we're going to find all of the different materials that we can create inside of Maya, including any render engine that you might have installed. In my case, I only have Arnold installed right now. But several years ago, I used to work with V-Ray. I used to work with RenderMan. I used to work with Redshift. And whenever you activate those render engines over here on the create tab you're going to find the different render engines um, available to you so maya by itself has a lot of nodes and i think this is what people want me to do but i don't think it's really necessary for anyone to know all of the nodes it's, it's mainly important for you to understand how the nodes connect and then use them on a case-by-case -case basis so uh the nodes are divided between shaders which are all of these ones right here you're not going to really be using most of this guys to be honest we have volumetric shaders which have to do with of course volumes we have displacement things like the displacement shader right here this one we do use uh 2d textures which i'm going to talk in just a second 3d textures which we're not really going to be using as much environment textures other textures and of course our lights so whenever you create a light you're also going to be able to see it here on the hypershade and the cool thing about this let's say i create like an area light right here the area light has a lot of information and we have things that we can apply to the area light so let's let's take a look at this thing right here this is where the important stuff happens when you have a material like this bling one right here, you're going to have all of these inputs. All of the little dots that you have on the left side are called inputs, and all of the ones that you have on the other side are called outputs. In this case, you can see that this bling shader is outputting something called a surface shader. So all of the attributes are here on this out color. All of the way that this thing is going to be like shown on render time is going to be right here. And by plugging this into a surface shader from a shading group, you're going to be able to get a material. So whenever we assign a, a shader to an object, we're also assigning it's a surface or a shader group right here. 
If you guys have seen my displacement videos, you know that when we create displacement, we actually don't connect the displacement to the actual shader itself. We connect it to the shading group. So if I were to create a displacement, I'm just gonna tap key and press a displacement. We're gonna get this, which is a shading group connected to the displacement and a displacement shader. And this, we just replug it all the way up here. And that way we create this new thing that has surface and displacement. We could even plug in a volume. So if I go to the volume shaders and I create something like this volume fog, you're gonna see that this special node right here, the out color of this thing is gonna be going into the surface shader. And we're gonna we're not even gonna be able to like visualize it right now because we're not really doing anything, but we're gonna be able to um, have like a really complex material. So I don't know, imagine if we wanted to do like some sort of like crystal ball that had like cracks on it that's displaced, and on the inside you see like clouds and stuff like swirling around, you probably would have a surface, a volume and a displacement shader on that specific material. There's of course other ways to do it, but that's one like general um, idea. Now, uh, any input that we have right here, it's color coded and this is really important. It took me a little while to understand it. It has to do a little bit with, um, what is it, with uh, like programming stuff. When you see a red dot, that means that it is expecting a float three, okay? What is a float? A float is any number that you can have between zero and one, usually. You can have flow numbers that go above that, but it's usually any number, 1, 0 0.5, 0 0.337, 0 0.7289, like you can have any number in that range and that is a float value. When we create, for instance, a color, so if I create, for instance, let's say a file texture, right? Very common. If we have a file texture right here, or actually let's keep it even simpler. I'm gonna use a ramp. This is a very common 2D texture right here, which is called a ramp. And a ramp it generates, as you can see, an out color. So if I go here to the ramp, I can say, hey, you know what? I want a gradient that goes from red to, let's say, a blue, okay? And I can plug in that color into the color parameter of our material. And now what I'm gonna get is I'm gonna get a material that has both colors going on its UV like uh, side from uh, on, a, on a vertical way from red to blue. This is what it was traditionally called or is traditionally called procedural material generation, which is we create materials, we create elements that do not need a texture map. We don't need UVs. Well, we do need UVs, but we don't need a texture that's coming from substance of our place. We can create all of the stuff right here. And understanding how all of this nodes is gonna allow us to create some more interesting shapes. So right now, as you can see, I'm outputting the out color of this ramp and I'm creating this thing right here. Now, if I were to go, let's say, to this checker pattern right here, you can see that this checkered pattern also has a, an out color. If I connect it right here, now instead of having the blue and the, and the purple um, or the blue and the red, I have this thing right here. How, how can we like modify this or how can we make like interesting things? Well, this is where the utilities node come into play because we have a lot of different mathematical things that we can use to generate like, slightly different results. For instance, we can try something like, I believe it's called a multiply. There we go, had the multiply divide, which is a node right here that is expecting two outputs through two float three outputs. So see how it's expecting three little connections right there? So I can say, hey, you know what? I want to output the color on the input number one, and I want to input the checker on input number two. What that will do, as you can see, is we're gonna get a completely different result on the final output because we're multiplying this ramp color against this white and black uh, colors over here. And uh, a rule of thumb is usually white is one and black is zero. So what happens when you multiply by zero? Zero, right? So that's why we get this to black. And what happens when you multiply by one? Well, you get this thing right here, right? Like the same color that you're getting. So, so we just like transfer it through. However, we could generate something a little bit more interesting. What if, we create another ramp over here. Let's delete this thing right here. And let's change the color on this ramp. Let's say, hey, I want this ramp to be like green and let's say yellow, okay? What we could do is we could add a new multiplied node, multiply the byte, and multiply this green and yellow against the purple and red, and then multiply that against the checkerboard. And this is what we're gonna get, a really interesting procedurally generated color by utilizing the nodes that we have right here. I would be lying if I told you that I know what every single one of these things do right here. It's it's like so, so complex. But for instance, we have this blend colors right there. And if you're at, if at any point you have any questions of what any of these nodes do, uh, going into the documentation is probably your best bet. I've never used them like on specific projects so that I could tell you exactly what they do. 
But there you go. So here I'm blending these colors. Uh, it's doing a like 50% blend. We can actually animate this slider, for instance, to go from one to another, which will be really, really interesting. And we can output this again against the uh, grid right here, and we're gonna get uh, that specific effect. So as you can see, I could eventually animate this blender node right here, this blender option, and this will allow me to generate a slightly different uh, color. Now, here's where things get really, really fun. Imagine now that I were to like add something to this blender node right here. As you can see, this blender node has a light green color. This means that it's expecting a float value, okay? So a float value is any number between, again, like zero and one or any number that you can think of. It could be four, five, three. It's just a float number means that you can have decimal points, okay? So if I go again to my 2D textures, I could go, for instance, for a noise. And noise is another like procedurally generated material that I could use the out color of this noise. I want to use it as a blender, but as you can see, I can't really do that. Why not? Because the out color, of course, is a, uh, like um, it's 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 pushing out three values, a float value. However, if I click this little plus icon, you can see that we get access to all of these other lines right here, and I could just very easily grab this R color and plug it into the blender. Why the R color? Because the R color holds most of the information of the black and white images. So as you can see right here, we're gonna get a really, really interesting effect where we are multiplying these two colors through the blend colors with a noise. This is how things get really, really, really crazy because here on the noise, I can change things such as the threshold, I can change the amplitude, I can change the ratio, okay? I can change the frequency ratio, which is kind of like tiling this thing a little bit more, and we create really, really interesting effects. Now, let me talk very briefly about this thing right here. This is a material viewer. By default, as you can see, we're rendering with hardware and it's giving us a nice result. We actually have an HDRI that's uh, giving us the image. This can be a little bit uh, performance heavy as well. So I normally turn it off or just close it, uh, but you can actually change this to Arnold and it's gonna render in real time how it would look inside of Arnold. This is actually rendering stuff. So as you can see, it's not as uh, like fast as you might uh, want. And I don't recommend doing this unless you're doing something very, very specific because this is pretty much like rendering and it could eat up the resources from your computer. But look at how, how interesting and cool this floor is looking. I mean, it looks really creepy and gross, but uh, this is all procedurally generated. So you can imagine that I can plug in and I'm actually gonna do it. Let me go back to hardware. So if we go over here and we just create a, a new floor plane, I can assign a dad blend material to this floor plane. And if I press number six, I'm gonna be able to see this whole thing working right here. If we go to Arnold lights and we do an Skydome light, let's bring in one of our like basic elements right here. Do I not have one right there? I was doing some animation. Uh, 2023 next to live as uh, source images I should have. that will work uh, yeah let's actually let's do this one it's like this sort of like night scene so let's go let's save this real quick I'm gonna save this as uh, hypershade let's go to our render options real quick and we're gonna render this as GPU Arnold and render so if we take a look at this we are translating that blend material and we're getting this now here's where the problems are going to start. Unfortunately, not all of the um, not all of the nodes that you're going to see normally in the hypershade are compatible with all of the other elements. Right now, it, it's supposed to be rendering the, the green channel and stuff, but unfortunately, Arnold does not like the Maya normal ramp map that we use. So usually, whenever you're using a render engine, you are going to have a couple of different options. You can see here's the HDRI, which again, we could modify a couple of things on the notes. So if we go to Arnold, you're going to see that Arnold, if we go to, I believe it's utility, should have its own ramp. And you can look this by pressing tab and doing AI ramp. And there you go. So AI ramp RGV. And this is a ramp that works with Arnold. Okay. It should also have some sort of like AI blend or something. But right now, let's just do this AI ramp. So I'm going to output this color over here on the multiply the byte. And we're going to go again. Let's go from a red to a blue. OK, so now if we render. The ramp should be working properly, as you can see right here, we're getting the, the nice like distribution on the whole thing. Now, the interesting thing about nodes, again, is that we can actually like create really, really, really crazy stuff if we know and if we start like 
like moving things and changing things from one position to another. So you can see here, this ramp, I would love to be able to change the color when it's selected. How can I do that? Well, if I select this guy right here and I click this little buttons over here, I'm gonna be able to, oh, it's actually not letting me see more colors. That's really weird. There we go. That's a little bit better. We're not outputting things. No, it seems like we're not gonna be able to to do it. Sometimes you will get, like, as you can see, we have the input right here, but it doesn't seem like we have a lot of inputs, to be honest. So what we could do is we could try to intercept this ramp with the noise. And again, let's see if now with the blender option here, we're gonna go from out color to color one, and then color two is gonna be, uh, is gonna be both the color and the noise. I'm gonna try to use both of them. And this is gonna be on input one. And let's see if we can get this to render. So that's pretty much the magic of, uh, no, it's not working. The, the noise is not working. So we're probably gonna have to use an Arnold noise. That is the magic of the hypersheet. Again, I'm not the, the most like a uh, well-versed person to ask about all of the different uh, like blender or rendering notes. You probably are gonna have to do a, a little bit of investigation on your own if you wanna use the specific ones. We normally don't use this guys as much, or at least I don't use this because I don't do a lot of like procedurally generated materials or things, but it is important that you understand how inputs and outputs work. Now, one final thing I wanna mention here on Arnold, we have other uh, like shaders, for instance, we have the ambient occlusion shader, which is really cool to do uh, ambient occlusion renders. We have a wireframe shader, this one right here. We have the utility shader. We actually showed that on the hair creation uh, guide that I have. Um, and the AI standard surface is probably the most like common material that we're gonna use. And look at how many inputs we have. All of these inputs can be modified and can be edited to create slightly different effects. So if you wanna learn a little bit more about this, one of the best things you can do is just start playing around, create some materials and start playing around with them until you get something that looks really, really interesting. Well, that's it guys. I know it was a little bit of a theoretical video. It's probably not gonna be the most seen video in the channel. It's not very exciting, but it's important information. And hopefully you guys learned a little bit, uh, like a couple of things here or there about how the Hypershade generally works. Very, very important part of Maya, the connections about the materials, we've done them several times, but if you want me to do them again, let me know in the comments and I'll be happy to do so. And uh, that's it guys. Make sure to check down here the um, the course again, 90% off until March 6th. So if you wanna get the course, even if you're gonna be like watching a little bit later, this could be a good opportunity opportunity. Check the link down here. Make sure to leave us a like, a share, a comment. Anything is appreciated. Um, thank you so much for your support, guys. Even more cool things are coming here to the channel and to the whole Nexted community. So make sure to stay tuned and uh, yeah, have a good one. I'll see you back on the next one. Bye-bye.